Uh, next up is Raphael Parker, who's called the, in some places it's called the father of uh, first person video hobbies are seen play. Uh, and joining with Brendan Schulman, his lawyer, uh, who is defending him from the FAA, who has levied a ten thousand dollar fine. And you'll hear a lot more about that, ladies and gentlemen. Raphael Parker, Brendan Schulman. Hello, everyone. My name is Raphael. Hi, I'm Brendan Schulman from Kramer Eleven, and I'm Raphael's lawyer. I've also been flying radio control model planes for twenty years. Um, just like to say at the outset that everything I'm saying is my own personal view, not that of my law firm or any of its clients, except possibly the one standing right next to me. Nor should it be taken as legal advice. Um, we're going to talk about the very first civilian drone litigation in the United States. Before we get into that, Rafael, can you tell us about Team Black Sheep? Uh, yeah, Team Black Sheep, uh, we're just a couple of guys from Switzerland um, flying remote control airplanes and we do all sorts of daredevil stunts all around the world. Um, and just to give you sort of an idea of what we do, uh, we brought a video. So we thought, why not make it ourselves? Uh, this is one of our quadcopters that we make. We also produce flying wings uh, and certain, certain accessories for, for this sector of the hobby. So imagine yourself on a hill 110 years ago in North Carolina. And you see a couple of guys there. They've got a device you've never seen before. And they're about to do something very bold and possibly dangerous. Out of the corner of your eye, you see a black SUV pull up. And out of that SUV, a number of people from Washington come out. And they say, stop what you're doing. This is illegal. We don't have our permission. You have to stop. Well, maybe I'm exaggerating. After all, there weren't SUVs in 1903. And maybe the Wright brothers would have said, well, gee, this is just some kind of delay. We'll work through it. We'll deal with these people from Washington. And then we'll move forward. Um, and, you know, maybe it would be a smart idea to have some rules in place before the Wright brothers put their machine into the air. But delay does have a consequence. And as you probably know, the Wright brothers were in competition with other people worldwide to move forward with manned flight. And in fact, they weren't the first to achieve manned flight, though they were the first to achieve controlled and sustained flight in the air. And that's what put them at an advantage vis-a-vis -vis everyone else in the world. What followed from that success was a century of American dominance in aviation. And in 1909, the Wright brothers took their airplane and brought it around the country, including to New York, and showed it off. Raphael, does this look familiar to you? <laughs> Very much so. 
What do you know about this uh, particular statue? Well, this is actually one of my favorite flying spots. <laughs> uh, and boy, did that Jack get us into trouble. <laughs> uh, well, it actually, it didn't really get us into legal issues, but it, it really put us on the map, and, and we've been followed ever since. Um, yeah, and have you flown elsewhere in the United States? Oh yeah, um, we, we went to we went to the Southwest. We we traveled uh, San Francisco, as you saw in the video before, Monument Valley, Las Vegas, uh, everywhere. And ever since we started the New York City flight, um, you know, we were kind of like always in the gray area. Um, but the FAA always announced that they were looking into it, but they never really ever did anything because we were just model airplane enthusiasts. Um, right until... So the FAA had to trouble you with respect to your other flights around the country, but that changed recently with respect to your flight in Virginia. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I, I went to Charlottesville in Virginia and we shot uh, footage for the medical campus um, of, of the University of Virginia. And uh, an advertising agency was interested in possibly using this footage for an for, uh, uh, ad for the campus. Uh, and I think we have the video or a part of it, so let's show that. <laughs> to that video, seeing that video, the FAA is seeking to impose upon Raphael a $10,000 fine. Uh, and they're doing so under the recklessness provision in the Federal Aviation Regulations, 91.13, which is about reckless operation of an aircraft that endangers life or property. And that's a regulation that has always been applied to manned aircraft in the context of very dangerous things, like overloading your airplane, not putting enough fuel into it, uh, things like that. So what is it about Raphael's flight in Virginia that's different from all the other ones that you saw in the earlier clip? Well, there's one thing. Raphael was alleged to have charged money for the video. And if you've been following the news on drones, you may have come to the conclusion, based on some of these articles or others, that it is illegal to operate a drone in the United States for money. The commercial operation is prohibited. And the FAA has gone around issuing cease and desist letters uh, in particular to aerial photography companies, real estate agents, saying you cannot do this legally. Well, I'm here to say, as a matter of personal opinion, but also one that we put into our motion to dismiss the case against Raphael, that that is not so. There is no enforceable federal regulation prohibiting the operation of commercial drones. Now, for sure, the FAA will tell you that there is such a prohibition, that it's illegal to charge money for flying a model airplane or your quadcopter or any other drone, whatever that may be in your, in your case. Um, but the FAA doesn't get to just make up the rules as it goes. You can't just issue a policy statement and say this is now binding law. So here I'm going to get a little bit legalistic. I think it's OK because we're at a law school. Um, so here's a crash course, if you'll pardon the pun, on unmanned aircraft uh, law. So unmanned aircraft actually predate the existence of the modern FAA by 30 years. They used to be called model airplanes or model aircraft. And really the first uh, modeling championship nationally was 1923, it was that early. The FAA had nothing to say about model aircraft for 60 years. Then in 1981, they did say something. They issued this, an advisory circular, which set out and encouraged voluntary compliance with a number of straightforward and general safety guidelines. Things like don't fly above 400 feet, don't fly near an airport. Make sure your plane works properly before you fly your spectators. Stay away from noise sensitive areas. Those kinds of things. But this is a voluntary guideline. It's voluntary. Compliance is encouraged. And it has never been enforced. It is not the law. 
Uh, and in fact, the FAA has been very hands-off with respect to model aircraft in the decades that followed the 1981 advisory circular. Even when model aircraft have hurt people, uh, and some very rare and tragic instances killed people, the FAA has never taken action to enforce a penalty or any other regulation with respect to the model aircraft. Now, all of this changed in 2007. And we can talk about some of the reasons why there may have been a policy change at the FAA. I think we've heard some of them. In my view, a number of things were going on in the world that made a difference. You had unmanned aircraft systems overseas killing people. I think you had people starting to think about ways in which the same kind of technology could be used domestically for law enforcement, for surveillance, search and rescue, and for other commercial applications that we've heard about this morning. Uh, and I think also the word drone started to be used in a negative way and was starting to apply to all sorts of technologies. Um, so, and perhaps the most important thing, most important aspect of what was going on in 2007 is what happens to all sorts of disruptive technologies when they emerge. I think there's an instinctive reaction um, to delay and to avoid it. In other words, let's put it off, we will figure out how to deal with this later. We can't do it right now, we don't understand it. And I think that's what the FAA did in 2007. They issued this policy statement in the Federal Register, they published it. And this basically, for the first time, makes a distinction between model aircraft that are flown for recreational or hobby purposes and model aircraft that are flown for commercial <coughs> or business purposes. The very first time there's a distinction. If you are a hobbyist or a recreational flyer or a model airplane, you're still subject to the 1981 voluntary guidelines. But if you're flying for money, if you're flying for a business purpose or whatever that means, you are a commercial operator of an unmanned aircraft system, and it is illegal to do it. You cannot do it, it's prohibited. Unless you get special permission from the FAA. But if you don't, if you just go out and do it, you are breaking the law. And that is certainly what they say, and they follow that up with cease and desist letters. Now, there's just uh, one problem with this policy statement. Uh, this is not how regulations are made, at least not in this country. Okay, the, the Administrative Procedures Act, which is the statute that governs how federal agencies create and issue enforceable regulations, requires a notice and comment period. And this is not just a technicality or something trivial. This is actually our democratic system as applied to the bureaucracy of an agency. They can't just go out and issue rules telling people what they can and can't do. There's a formal process for getting a rule in place, and it goes something like this. They issue a notice of proposed rulemaking, it's published, people have a chance to see it, comment on it and write it, they have a chance to go to public hearings, and then, taking those comments into account, the agency, whether it's the FAA or another agency, issues the final rule, and that then becomes law. Uh, now, to be sure, the FAA itself recognizes that that's how regulations are made, and that's also how they are changed or amended. This is right from the Federal Aviation Regulations. And they, uh, this indicates, I think quite clearly, that the FAA uses the APA procedure to issue new regulations or to amend existing ones. Now, this did not happen in the case of unmanned aircraft. They still have not issued a notice of proposed rulemaking, and they are years behind. And uh, you can find a number of courts, countless courts, uh, over the period of decades that have invalidated agency attempts to issue binding substantive rules in the absence of APA rulemaking. So, for example, issuing policy statements or saying, well, we're just interpreting an existing regulation. Courts have struck that down and said, no, you have to go and do the, do the procedure that's required under the APA. Otherwise, your new regulation is not, uh, is not valid. Uh, now, I think we can all uh, agree, as we've discussed this morning, that this is just groundbreaking, incredible technology. There are so many applications for it. Um, demand for Raphael's equipment that he built is, is really strong. I think it, his product out there was back ordered and it still is for a number of months after it came out this summer. And so there's incredible useful technology here. And uh, the FAA can continue to issue cease and desist letters. They've been doing it for six years. They might continue for another six. They're way behind schedule. And I fear that because of that bureaucratic delay, uh, or because of unfounded fears that exist uh, with respect to drone technology, that America will miss the next century in aviation and no longer be the dominant player. So on the one hand, this is a case about a very daring and talented uh, flyer of model airplanes who creates amazing videos, uh, ones that inspired me to get into FPV myself. 
Uh, but on the other hand, I think this also is about how future laws and policies should or shouldn't apply to this technology going forward. Thank you.